Soldiers, you are spilling your blood for Hitler, a sacrifice that benefits neither yourselves or the German people. Nothing can save you from this carnage. Break from this army of Hitlerite oppressors, otherwise you will face destruction. The 26 soldiers of the 1st Company of your regiment, who, together with their company commander, Oberleutnant Rudolf Kremer, gave themselves up to the Russians on the 12th of March 1943, can show you the path of survival. For them, the horrors of war are over. After the war, they will return to their homeland healthy and sound. Whether you return to your families or as fascist invaders are destroyed upon Russian soil depends entirely upon the decision you make. Often the Russian propaganda units used crude photo montages assembled from the pictures and names taken from identity documents that had been confiscated from German prisoners or collected from the dead. In our sector, as well as on all other fronts, Soviet aircraft dropped tons of such leaflets over our lines. The soldiers enthusiastically collected them and put the leaflets to good use at the latrines, as paper for this purpose was always in short supply. The communications unit of the division retained a special reconnaissance and interception platoon. This unit would dispatch specially trained teams behind the enemy lines to tap into the landline networks. Thus, the telephone communications of the enemy could often be intercepted and overheard. In this manner we could hear the messages of the Russian officers, and through the often coarse language we learned that women were playing an ever-increasing role on the enemy staff as communications technicians or logistics officers. We intercepted Russian propaganda as well. In one instance we intercepted the orders of the day issued to a rifle company opposite our position. This order detailed the plan and timeline for capturing the strategically important railroad crossing at Kirishi and the largest wooden match factory of the Soviet Union. Later interceptions announced in great detail the assault on Kirishi against a strongly fortified enemy and its subsequent capture by the brave Soviet soldiers. In reality, Kirishi had been systematically evacuated by our forces prior to the execution date of this order. On another occasion we overheard a regimental commander berate a junior officer for failing to capture booty during an operation. How can I capture anything? The exasperated officer responded. When the Fritzes take every Scheistreck with them. The word Scheistreck was spoken in German. One night our main battle position was penetrated by approximately 50 Soviet soldiers. Using great skill and stealth, they successfully climbed through the fortification in an area thinly guarded by sentries without a shot being fired. After discovering the infiltrators within our lines, the soldiers manning the two machine guns on the right and left flanks of the area of penetration took the enemy under fire. Several of the Soviets fell dead or wounded. The remainder scrambled through the darkness to escape through our lines. During the encounter, not a shot was returned, and at dawn we discovered by examining the bodies of the Russians struck by the machine gun fire that no firearms were among them. Still clenched in their cold fists were opened razors with which they had planned to silently cut the throats of our sentries. On the 4th of December we were on the offensive again. With the assault reserve of the regiment, I arrived at the small stream where it cut through a triangular wooded area. To our left, Schmidt's battalion was engaged in heavy fighting, and opposite us tanks were moving into position toward our location. I ordered that absolute noise discipline be observed along our sector, and that only clearly recognisable infantry targets be fired on when and if necessary. I immediately requested reinforcement in the form of a pack with crew, not knowing when we could expect the arrival of this direly needed weapon. Ahead of us and to our left was located Feuerstein's squad, which held a commanding view of the battle area and of the stream ahead. Suddenly a machine gun fired from Feuerstein's position. A Russian company had been observed moving along the length of the stream, providing infantry support for two T-34 tanks. When taken under fire, the Soviets had fled behind the protection of the tanks, one of which immediately rocked to a halt and pivoted its massive turret toward the hidden MG nest. A direct hit from the heavy gun struck the machine gun position, instantly killing Feuerstein, who had faithfully served under my command for many months. Additional tanks immediately opened fire from the tree line opposite us. Standing with Juckel and Sepp in a shallow trench, we were observing them through binoculars when a tank round struck a nearby tree to our left, 
and sent it crashing to the ground. Juckle slowly turned his head to face me, and I saw that only a small stump was remaining of the ever-present pipe between his lips. A shell splinter had cleared the rim of his helmet and had cut cleanly through the head of the pipe, and he muttered softly, that one got me, and sank slowly to the ground. His left upper arm was red with blood soaking through the white camouflage battle smock, and I unbuttoned his blouse and tunic to see that a large shell fragment had nearly amputated his left arm just below the shoulder. Taking a mess tin strap, I bound his arm tightly just below the armpit until the flow of blood ceased. Throughout the incident, Jokul had not made a sound, but he now smiled faintly and remarked that it appeared that he had finally received his long-awaited Heimatschuss. I helped him to his feet and he disappeared toward the rear, steadily marching upright without assistance. Some weeks later, I received a letter from a hospital in Vienna, which opened with the words, My dear Leutnant. Juckel wrote that with the exception of a left arm, he remained in one piece. He also added that he lacked tobacco for his pipe, as the hospital did not consider tobacco to be a priority item for their beleaguered supply system. I underlined this passage of his letter with a red marker from my map case and passed the letter on to the regimental supply officer, Hertel, with a request that some tobacco be sent to him. To my immense satisfaction and surprise, I received another letter approximately four weeks later, thanking me for fulfilling his implied request. The next day we welcomed the arrival of a 75mm pack and crew. We were immensely relieved to receive the anti-tank gun, as we were otherwise without effective protection from the Soviet armour that lay opposite us. Once again, I found myself in my long-forgotten element of the Panzerjäger, and I spoke with the crew while re-familiarising myself with the weapon. We carefully positioned the gun and lay in wait, but no tank presented itself as a target. The following day we crossed over a bridge constructed of inflatable boats spanning a tributary that separated us from the A3 battalion. The enemy took notice that reinforcements were arriving and attempted to advance with their tanks, two of which fell prey to our 75mm pack. The remainder hurriedly withdrew to concealment. During the night two of the tanks, with infantry piled on the chassis, broke through the lines in the area held by Schmidt. Some of our companies were thrown out of their positions, and I counter-attacked with the reinforced Pionier Platoon, 437 as assault reserve. We advanced to a small depression 150 metres from the earthwork system, where the Russians had penetrated. Selecting two squads to take into the counter-attack, I left the remainder, numbering approximately 60 men, lying 200 metres behind us in a depression. The plan was to take as few men as I deemed necessary for the initial assault in order to minimise casualties. The remaining men were to follow up the assault after our initial thrust. On a pre-planned light signal, the forward observers ordered our artillery support to open fire, and within seconds our artillery rounds were impacting hardly 30 to 50 metres before us. As the explosions crept forward and enveloped the enemy trench systems, we advanced and soon began receiving sporadic fire from the Russians. A submachine gun opened fire on us at close range from a concealed trench, striking one of the machine gunners in the shoulder. With no time to lose, we stormed the positions, firing from point-blank range and tossing grenades into the earthworks. I threw myself on the edge of a trench, from where I could distinctly hear the hushed voices of the Russians less than a metre's distance below me as they crouched in the darkness. Fearfully remaining in their position, they did not trust themselves to peer over the edge of the berm. Otherwise, they could have simply pulled me into the position with them. With a pounding heart, I pulled the priming cords from two hand grenades and waited until the last second before rolling them over the berm and into the trench below me. The grenades exploded with a cloud of dust and smoke, and holding my pistol over the edge of the trench, I fired a number of shots into the unseen targets. Screams of the enemy wounded broke forth, and I rolled into the trench, falling directly on a wounded Russian. I shouted for the men to follow, and Shorsh stormed into the trench system and secured our left flank, his machine gunner firing bursts from the hip with his MG-42. Sepp, Humpert and the others followed me into the defence network. From our position, we observed a group of Russians to our right spring from the ground and dash through our fire along the perimeter of the earthwork system 
to a tank squatting ominously in the darkness farther to the rear, its silhouette visible against flashes of our bursting artillery shells. Within a few minutes the Russians had been pushed from the trenches, and a number of them sought shelter in a depression. As we regrouped and prepared for a counterattack, Sepp Sturm collected a handful of grenades and, running toward the perimeter, he pulled the lanyards and tossed the grenades one after another into the depression. The Russians left a number of dead and wounded behind them, and we took twelve prisoners. Following this attack by our small group, the Russians lost the initiative for assaulting the position, and throughout the following days they displayed no further inclination to attack. I immediately recommended Sepp Sturm to be awarded the Iron Cross, and this award was presented to him the following morning by the regimental commander. On the 14th of November, the 132D Infantry Division was relieved in their sector of the Kusinka Front by units of the 96th Infantry Division and the 12th Luftwaffe Field Division. We were then transported by rail to Army Group Loch to reinforce the front west of Neville near Pustoshka. At this location, the division was not sent into action as a unit immediately, but it served as assault reserve for the defence and reinforcement of the threatened divisions. With the exception of the units remaining in the area of Isakovo, all of its battalions were used for defence and attack by the 81st and 329th Infantry Divisions. It was planned that the 132D Infantry Division would attack toward the west from positions south of Nevedro Lake in support of the offensive launched by the 16th Army at the end of November. This offensive was planned with the objective of enclosing in a pocket the Soviet units that had broken through south of Pustoshka. This attack, which would have freed the vital supply route to Sheglovo Lopatovo using Grenadier Regiment 436 and units of Police Regiments 16 and 9, was launched on the 29th of November. In the face of overwhelming enemy strength, the units advanced toward their objectives of Vasilyeva, Pustki and Height, 192.7. However, due to heavy losses suffered during the previous months, for which there had been no replacements, the assault ground to a halt. A second attack was planned for the 10th of December, following the completion of another supply route reaching the areas of Idritsa, Nishcha train station, Lushi and Lopatovo. The division planned to use Grenadier Regiment 436 and Grenadier Regiment 174 for the renewed attack. However, the plans were never carried through, as the division was redesignated Battle Group Wagner and combined with the 3rd Estonian SS Volunteer Brigade and the Latvian Police Regiment Riga, was assigned to reinforce the sector between Drissa and Jasno Lake. It was expected that an enemy offensive from the area of Neville would fall on this sector and that the enemy would strike in the direction of Polosk. This expected attack threatened the entire right wing of Army Group North. The new division sector, which extended for a distance of 50 kilometres, remained quiet, with the exception of minor reconnaissance actions, until mid-January. Throughout these weeks, the units remained at work reinforcing and building defences, roads and bridges. The rear echelons were evacuated of all civilians, following an increase in the partisan activity throughout the dense forests that were so prominent in North Russia. On the 12th of January 1944, the enemy launched their expected attack. Throughout the early days of the new year, enemy activity had been observed in the areas of Neshtcherdo Lake, Yasno Lake and Nevedro Lake. The Soviets attacked in a northwest direction with the goal of freeing Idritsa in the northern area of the division sector. The enemy quickly won ground against weakly held positions defended by foreign units and police detachments and penetrated toward Pustoya, Mogilino Lake and Sviblo Lake. The Latvian police regiment Riga, operating farther south between Jasno Lake and Gusino Lake, was able to establish a blocking line along Pucharisa Ispishtsha Sagatia, Shulyatino Diatli. By the evening of the 12th of January, the Soviet advance was halted, and the police regiment reinforced their positions through equipment and command and control assistance, provided by the 132D Infantry Division. On the 14th of January, the division received orders from the 16th Army to engage the enemy forces that had broken through along the line on the southern edge of Dubrovo to Aleandrovo. This attack was launched at 20 o'clock, 
and succeeded in containing the enemy forces. On the 15th of January at 6.30, the enemy struck back with a strength of eight to nine battalions against our weakly held sector, which was now defended by three understrength companies. The enemy forces, heavily supported by aircraft, artillery and multiple rocket launchers, struck the line at Pucharisa, Ispischa, Sagatia, Shulyatino and Podberesia. Regional breakthroughs at Pucharisa, Sagatia and Shulyatino were contained in a counter-attack, and heavy fighting north of Tshaiki and Lushi took place in the area following close combat and direct fire support from field artillery. Throughout the 16th of January, repeated attacks against Diatli and the positions to the northeast were successfully repelled, and the 120 grenadiers manning the defences at Diatli were ordered to counterattack at 18 o'clock. The counterattack threw the enemy forces back and sealed the salient to the west of Sagatia. On the 19th of January 1944, the division turned over the sector to the newly arrived 290th Infantry Division. January, February 1944, near Diatli. The thermometer read 20 degrees below zero. The Soviets had again broken through the thinly held German lines. Weakened security battalions, many consisting of foreign units, were compelled to surrender their positions under pressure from the strong enemy forces. I moved forward with my men along a well-worn roadway in the winter night. The Lanzers moved instinctively with rifles at the ready. The dirty white battle smocks gleamed faintly in the darkness as the column wound its way forward. We were assisted by the use of three pony sleds, which were heavily loaded with weapons and equipment. It was a night of total darkness, and although our eyes were long accustomed to the night, each man could only faintly discern the soldier several paces ahead of him. I attempted to follow the planned route carefully occasionally finding it necessary to scan the crumpled map in the dim glow of a field light hidden beneath a shelter quarter. After several hours of marching, we arrived at the headquarters of a foreign security battalion, and during the next hour confusion reigned as we attempted to gain information about the area. After several frustrating attempts to communicate with the occupants of the position, a German officer was located but he was able to provide little definitive information on the situation or the lay of the front, so I was again left to my instincts. We set out, following a narrow trail that led us toward the southeast. Hours earlier, I had been instructed by the regimental commander to establish a new defensive line on a small terrain feature in this area. Our destination was a small rise in elevation referred to on the map as the village of Diatli. As we approached the area of the village, we suddenly received fire from submachine guns and machine guns on our left. We returned fire, and the guns immediately fell silent. With field glasses, I searched through the breaking dawn for the huts and buildings that would reveal the location of the village to us. As the horizon grew lighter, it occurred to me that in the darkness we had bypassed the village, the remains of which were now barely visible immediately behind us. Having fallen victim to the war, the village now consisted only of several blackened chimneys standing among the barely recognisable ruins of burned cottages. A low fence and a well came into my view through the binoculars, indicating the location of a former dwelling, the remains of which were covered with a thin blanket of snow. Quickly issuing commands, I ordered Feldwebel Staffen to the right flank with his platoon. Feldwebel Bernhardt was to remain at our present location. We established the machine gun positions among the ruins of the village as isolated rifle shots began breaking forth in the growing light. With the coming of dawn, I was better able to assess our surroundings. The village was situated on a commanding height that descended evenly on all sides in a gentle slope. Approximately one kilometre distant on another terrain feature was Staffan's platoon. Unknown to me at the time, while carrying out my directions, the platoon commander had fallen victim to a Soviet sniper hidden in the forest, who had fired a single shot that struck him in the head. Later in the morning, we were cautiously approached by an officer whose red-piped collar tabs, indicating artillery service, were visible beneath his field jacket. The Hauptmann introduced himself as the forward observer of a battery located barely two kilometres to our rear and stated that the guns were fully ready to provide us with support. With this comforting information, we continued to prepare for the inevitable Russian attack. For the remainder of the day, the forest lay silent. 
The forward observers joined us as we engaged in building a banya deep in the earth to serve as a headquarters. As the temperature continued to fall with the ensuing darkness, I permitted the men to rotate the sentry duties on their positions to give them the opportunity to warm themselves, as the lighting of any fire would draw immediate fire and was thus strictly forbidden. I had long since learned that rotating sentries as often as feasible would result in the sentries remaining more alert and less prone to fall victim to the effects of cold and fatigue. The Soviets had planned to attack the foreign security units that had occupied this area before our arrival. With taut nerves we lay in our snow holes and waited as darkness descended on us again. Just before midnight the unmistakable sounds of commands and shouts were heard from the Russian positions. Then came the ominous sound of heavy boots treading through the snowdrifts. We steeled ourselves to wait until the ghostly figures broke into the open before us, and the MG-42 immediately on my left opened fire with a long, ripping burst. Flares arched skyward, and the air was filled with the explosions and screams of open battle. Tracer bullets bounced and ricocheted through the darkness. With deafening bursts, the support promised by our artillery battery began falling with unerring accuracy on the ranks of attackers. The enemy was beaten back amid bursting shells, but not before my friend and squad leader Herfelder fell mortally wounded. The following day the enemy repeated their attacks, which were again repulsed. The dawn of the third day found us still clinging to the battered positions. Again and again the ranks of shouting enemy forces attempted to overrun our positions, now with the support of mortars and artillery batteries, which lay barrages on us in preparation for the assaults. I was required to hold a line one kilometre in length, with only forty men. Along our neighbouring front to the right was a five hundred metre breach in the lines, which reportedly was manned during the hours of darkness by a reconnaissance unit. During the night of 16 the 17th of January, the Russians were active again. Under the cover of darkness they circled the village to our left with a strong assault force, silently penetrating an area where we had no support and striking the small team located in that sector. From our positions we could observe muzzle flashes and the explosions of grenades. After about an hour, Sepp Sturm appeared, creeping on all fours through the darkness toward our position. He had suffered a grazing wound to his shoulder, and his camouflage battle jacket, mess tin, canteen, and even his entrenching tool were riddled with bullet holes from the Soviet submachine guns. During the evening twilight, the Russian unit had overrun our left wing, and Sepp had taken cover in a depression while bullets cracked around him and riddled his jacket and equipment. He had waited until he was certain that he was no longer being observed, and then made his way back to our position. We reinforced the shrinking perimeter around the banya. In the darkness I was standing in the chest-high trench when I observed to my half-left a light signal behind the hulk of a burned-out tank. The light would blink intermittently behind us for several seconds, remain inactive for approximately a minute, and then the signal would be repeated. As I was preparing to send a team to investigate the light, I observed the silhouettes of twenty or thirty figures moving rapidly toward the signal barely twenty paces away. I instantly opened fire with my submachine gun at the figures now vaguely visible against the white snow, and the alarm raced throughout our position. All our machine guns were positioned on their lafettes facing the front and could not immediately be brought to bear on the infiltrators. We took them under fire with small arms and hand grenades. I was vaguely aware of the glowing fuse of a Russian grenade as it flew past me from the darkness, and I was then enveloped in a soft sinking sensation and knew nothing else. As I slowly regained consciousness I felt light-headed and unable to orient myself to my surroundings. My legs radiated with pain, and I felt paralysed, unable to move any part of my body. Slowly I realised that my battle smock was pulled over my head, and as I began to regain movement I could feel pain that encompassed my every limb. I was suddenly shivering with cold, and the ringing in my brain ceased as I reached up and pulled my heavy jacket from my face. After several seconds I had regained enough sight to discern through the darkness the comforting forms of Sepp and Yuckel bending over me. Their familiar eyes peering from under the distinctive silhouettes of the whitewashed Wehrmacht helmets. During the heat of the assault, they had managed to drag me out of the direct line of fire and away from the Russians charging through the snow. 
The Russians ravaged the Banya with Molotov cocktails. The strong point on our left had been overrun, and in our sector there were only ten of us remaining. As dawn appeared on the horizon, we received reinforcements in the form of one Feldwebel, accompanied by twenty-five men, who had been dispatched from a Silesian division. With our reinforcements in tow, we reoccupied the right flank of the village, from where the Russians held a small ravine, barely one hundred metres distant, which offered them concealment and protection from our artillery. With the coming of dusk, we attacked. We assaulted and overran the enemy position without artillery support, and together with Sepp and Jukel, I closed on a depression into which a Russian had fled with a shoulder-fired anti-tank weapon. I was able to detect his crouching form in the growing twilight just as he squeezed the trigger, and the hot projectile roared past, burning my battle smock and tunic between my arm and hip. I struck him squarely in the chest with my assault rifle, and he tumbled backward as Juckel sprang forward and thrust the muzzle of his submachine gun in his face. The terrified Russian stared at us, eyes wide with fear, and lay motionless. Pulling him to his feet, Juckel instructed a radio man to take him to the rear. The Russians quickly counterattacked, storming out of the darkness and throwing hand grenades. The Feldwebel of the reinforcement unit, who had performed with great courage and reliability while serving with us, was struck by a bullet in the abdomen, the force of the round spinning him backward before he collapsed. Again we beat back the attack, and against overwhelming odds we recaptured and held the village of Diatli. With the coming of daylight we risked sniper fire to examine our tiny battlefield. We discovered a warm shelter of straw within the knocked-out tank at our rear, and determined that either a partisan or an infiltrator had used the tank as an orienteering point to vector attacking forces through our thinly held lines. It would have been a simple matter to penetrate through the gaps in the line and to mass attackers at our rear, by whom we would have been easily annihilated. Only the signal light had revealed the position and the plan, and its discovery had prevented our certain destruction. During another incident, a lone individual wearing a German officer's rank insignia on a uniform with red artillery piping on his shoulder boards and collar tabs appeared suddenly in our midst. His unexpected presence, here on the front line without the customary battle dress and armed only with a pistol, aroused my immediate suspicion. When I challenged him to halt and to provide his name and unit, he suddenly wheeled and wildly fired two shots in my direction. I returned fire with my submachine gun. However, he had plunged into the darkness and disappeared. It became obvious that infiltrators were penetrating our lines dressed in captured uniforms, and it was rumoured that in some sectors, Russian assault units were being led by personnel dressed in our uniforms, who spoke excellent German. It was known that our sentries were occasionally confronted by plaintive cries for help, delivered in flawless German, which emanated from the Soviet lines. This was clearly an attempt to exploit the Lancer's natural sense of compassion for his comrades in order to lure our soldiers to their deaths. With a reinforced infantry pioneer platoon and an alarm company, I assumed command of the sector northwest of Diatli in February. During the first few days we suffered numerous casualties in dead and wounded. The Russians dug themselves in along a trench system that ran the length of a wooded height and occupied positions within 150 metres from our location. We remained under constant danger of sniper fire, and received machine gun fire whenever we exposed ourselves to the enemy position. In an attempt to end the harassment, we called mortar fire on the positions opposite us. However, the Russians clung tenaciously to their trenches, and continued to deliver deadly sniper fire. At length I positioned a heavy machine gun on the line and carefully adjusted the lafette to train on the exact point where I had last observed the light blue muzzle flash of a sniper's rifle in the early morning hours. In addition to the machine gun, we trained the pack directly on a suspected enemy position. As the evening twilight fell, we again found ourselves under fire, and on command the machine gunner opened fire, accompanied by the pack. Belt after belt of 7.92mm ammunition raced through the feed mechanism of the MG-42, and the pack fired high-explosive shells directly into the Soviet line. We instantly repeated this process whenever fired upon, and within a week it was said that we occupied the quietest sector of the entire regiment. 
Indeed, our own reconnaissance units reported that in the sector opposite us, the enemy now employed a limited number of snipers and machine gun crews, and used these only during hours of darkness. They would immediately withdraw into their rearward area at dawn. For the next several weeks, we suffered no further casualties along our sector of the line. As I made my nightly inspection of the line one evening in mid-February, a machine gunner reported that a large dog had been sighted about 30 metres from our position. I asked if the animal had been wearing a harness and pack strapped to its back, and the solider replied that it was possible. However, due to the poor light, he could not be certain. I then ordered that all such animals be shot on sight. In previous engagements, the Russians had sent dogs into our positions with armed mines strapped to their bodies. These animals had been trained to seek food under tanks and vehicles with engines running and would thus strike the detonators against the vehicle chassis. Using these tactics, the Soviets could also dispatch the animals through the barbed wire of our positions, opening holes in our defences or destroying tanks and other irreplaceable equipment. The explosives would kill any personnel within a radius of several metres and the shrapnel could inflict serious wounds at an even greater distance. The following morning, I inspected the area in front of our position and located large dog-like tracks. That evening, one of the animals was shot between our lines in an area from which it could not be recovered. The evening of the next day, as I was making my way through our positions back to the company headquarters, a large animal bolted hardly ten metres distant, sprinting rapidly through the dusk toward the enemy line. I opened fire from the hip with my submachine gun, and the animal tumbled and lay motionless in the snow. Immediately a burst from a nearby Maxim forced me and the nearby sentries to dive for cover, but later we were able to recover the dead animal from between the lines. It proved to be a fully grown wolf, which had obviously been feasting on the numerous corpses in the area between the Russian and German positions. The animal was of heavy build, with a pointed muzzle and powerful jaws. The ears were short and round, the thick winter fur was a grey-beige colour along the flanks and faded to light brown on the underside and was almost dark brown along the back. Sepp skinned the wolf, nailing the pelt to the side of our shelter with wire staples to dry after treating it with salt and birch ashes. After several days it was pronounced cured despite a slightly pungent order, and Gefreiter Dozer bundled it together and carried it back to Germany on furlough. Within a week it was being professionally prepared by Weisgerber in Stuttgart, and it remained one of the few souvenirs I retained from the entire experience on the Eastern Front. From 11 to the 12th of March, the division, as well as additional regiments provided by the 120th Infantry Division, remained engaged in heavy combat near Schwari. From 13 to the 19th of March, units of the division were placed under the 32nd and 83rd Infantry Divisions. The fighting at Rod remained fierce and brutal, with every metre of ground being desperately defended by the beleaguered Lanzers. From the 29th of March to the 4th of April, the division remained in defensive fighting along Neshtcherdo Lake and near Lobovo. The Red Army was unsuccessful in repeated attempts to penetrate the German defences, despite overwhelming superiority in tanks, artillery and aircraft. The snow and ice slowly receded. On Easter 1944, a Russian company attacked over the frozen Neshtcherdo Lake, but was repulsed, leaving the ice strewn with dead. Prisoners who were taken reported that the Soviets believed the West Bank to be poorly defended, and some of them attempted to convince us that the lake was no longer passable due to the recent thawing temperatures. We were fully aware that the lake remained frozen with ice one and one half metres thick, and that it would probably remain passable at least until the end of April or early May. On Easter morning, after I departed the headquarters following a situation briefing, the members of the company presented me with an Easter basket, carefully constructed with available articles from our position. Lying on a layer of soft moss were a dozen round, olive-coloured Russian hand grenades, which had been recovered from the bodies of the attackers and carefully arranged within the basket. Thus we celebrated Easter 1944. On the 23rd of June 1944, the Russians struck Army Group Center along a front 400 kilometers wide. The entire central front from Vitebsk to Kiev stood in flames. 
With full-strength, well-supplied divisions heavily supported by armour, aircraft and massive amounts of aid from the United States, the Red Army launched an attack against the exhausted German lines at Rushev, Smolensk and farther south. The Russians were now inflicting damage on the German army in the same manner that we had inflicted it on them in 1941 and 1942, during the periods of our great victories. Due to the obstinacy of Hitler, our generals could not proceed with the action needed to prevent the encirclement of entire armies. Offensives on an enormous scale cut through our foremost lines, raced deep into the hinterland and cut off vast numbers of men and material, forcing mass surrender or annihilation of the ensnared units. In the Bobruisk pocket, far south of our position at Yuknovo, the trapped divisions were defeated and annihilated. The survivors of these huge encirclements that took place during the first days of July found themselves on their bitter way to the gulags and prisoner of war camps. The reasons for the collapse of the Central Front were clear. We simply had too few soldiers, tanks and resources to hold the enormous areas to be contained in the East, and our Supreme Commander in Berlin refused to accept this reality. There now existed no divisions possessing the strength of our units that had won earlier victories. From the regiments that originally were composed of three battalions, there were now only two greatly weakened battalions remaining. The Pionier units and the artillery regiments were likewise weakened, having suffered severe losses in combat or having been stripped of personnel to serve as infantry. In Germany, within the Reich itself, again and again new divisions were raised in attempts to hold the many fronts against an ever stronger enemy. But the old divisions, those that had been on the front since the beginning, never received full replacements for the vast losses that had occurred over the years. One of the most serious problems that faced the Lanzas at the unit level was the fact that most of the experienced officers and non-commissioned officers had been killed or had suffered serious, debilitating wounds at the front and were no longer with us. Moreover, the Wehrmacht never fully developed or learned the tactics and methods of retreat. The German soldier was taught to view retreat solely as a defeat, with no advantages forthcoming. Even in the early years in the Reichswehr, the study of retreat, to include using this often necessary tactic to our advantage, was discouraged. After 1936, even the lesson plans for the teaching of a fighting withdrawal were stricken from the curriculum. Attack and halt were the only two methods of warfare hammered into us. In this regard, the Wehrmacht had entered into the war unprepared. The collapse of Army Group Center in June and July resulted in chaos. This was clearly exhibited by the countless units observed on the roads and bridges, fleeing to the rear seemingly leaderless and without direction, while other weakened units attempted to make their way through the mob toward the front to engage the onrushing enemy. Some battered units were overcome with panic and they streamed toward the west on foot and in vehicles of every description. The confusion, the panic-stricken lanzas, the jamming of all movements along the passable roads, would earlier have been considered as an inconceivable scenario, but the collapse of discipline and order had become reality. The Russians were able to increase the turmoil and confusion through constant attacks with their air force, which bombed and strafed all roadways and rail lines, leaving shattered, demoralised fragments of once-proud regiments strewn in their path. The strategic reserves were unable to make their way through the chaos to the front and remained jammed in the tangle of vehicles and men. The movement of entire units had become impossible, and the highest commander, to whom credit for the catastrophe should be awarded, was not present to witness what his decisions had wrought. As always, the soldiers in the field bore the brunt of these mistakes and paid with their lives. Army Group North was impacted by the collapse of the Central Front, as was the 30 Army Corps to the south. At the end of June, the enemy right wing broke out of the heights before Polosk. The 132D Infantry Division was holding a wide sector of the front before Yuknovo Moskachevo and the Velikaya sector. During the night 28 the 29th of June, a police security regiment moved forward to relieve the battered Lanzas holding the positions of the 1st Battalion, Grenadier Regiment 437. With 60 men remaining in the 2nd Company, 
We crawled from our defences in the swampy ground that we had held for weeks against overwhelming numbers of the enemy opposite us. We marched past the destroyed tank from the winter battle, its sides now streaked with rust and the hatches frozen open like gaping wounds, and we slowly wound our way along the splintered and scarred corduroy road through the swamp. Mess tins, entrenching tools and assorted equipment rang softly on the steel helmets hanging from our belts, and the Ivans sent departing shots after us. Five kilometres behind the front, the battalion mustered at the edge of a small wood that offered a semblance of concealment from the ever-present aircraft. Our company Spies, Novotny, supplied us with warm food and other small items that we had been unable to receive during the weeks we had been on the line. We spent several hours sitting along the edge of the road, or lying beneath the ragged pine trees, relishing the first warming rays of the early morning sunshine. It was a luxury once again to be able to stand erect without danger, once again to enjoy freedom of movement without the fear of meeting a sniper's bullet. The obligatory schnapps bottle made its rounds. The younger and less experienced Lanzers, recent arrivals to the weakened company, rejected offhand the burning home-brewed drink that left us with an unaccustomed tingling in the throat. We owed this rare amenity to the talents of Feldwebel Rohrer, who had skillfully fashioned a distillery from a battered Russian field kitchen that we had captured during the Crimean campaign. The stove had been modified for our use with a complicated tangle of copper tubing and bits of rubber fuel lines and had been fed a diet of potatoes and rhubarb gleaned from abandoned villages or captured from partisan caches. As we passed the bottle, we felt an instinctive bond that only the survivors could know. Together we had known wind and heat, life and death. We had experienced hails of bombs and shells. We had tended our wounded, buried our dead, and moved forward to the next encounter, knowing that eventually we would meet the end of our journey. Most of us owed our lives to the skill and self-sacrifice of others in our company, many of whom were no longer with us. We, the survivors, lay on the Russian soil, the smell and touch of which had become so familiar and dozed in the summer sun. As we lay quietly in small groups, consuming the schnapps and immersed in discussion of those things not associated with war, our idol was interrupted by the rhythmic sound of approaching horses. Sitting upright, I observed a recent arrival to the division, Oberstleutnant Katzmann, approaching with several members of the regimental staff. He reined his horse to a halt several metres from my position. Rising stiffly to my feet, I drew myself to attention and rendered a salute, greeting him as respectfully as possible under the given circumstances. Good afternoon, Herr Oberstleutnant, I called, holding my salute. He glared at me momentarily from his position on horseback, before sharply returning the salute. Leutnant Beidemann, you are drunk, he stated loudly and emphatically. Yes, Herr Oberstleutnant, I replied, I am drunk. As I remained standing, perhaps unsteadily at attention, the staff officer began to upbraid me for my condition. After several long seconds of a stern tirade, I noticed Feldwebel Pinoff rise to his feet and approach our location. With a long, glowing cigar hanging from one corner of his mouth, he marched forward. What is going on here? he abruptly demanded, his normally clear and precise demeanour obviously affected by the abundant quantity of schnapps consumed by the roadside. No one talks to our Leutnant like this. He suddenly brushed past me and approached the mounted Oberstleutnant, exclaiming, We don't let anyone treat our Leutnant like a recruit. I desperately moved forward in an attempt to grasp him by the shoulder to stop his verbal assault, and Katzman sat upright in the saddle with indignation, alternately shifting his glare from me to the oncoming Feldwebel. Before I could stop him, and before Katzman could utter a sharply worded reply, Pinoff had grasped the reins of the mount's halter at the bit. Quickly leaning over as if to speak softly to the horse, he pulled the large animal toward him as he held tightly to the halter. Suddenly the lit cigar touched the sensitive muzzle of Katzman's mount and the horse exploded into action. Rearing sharply and flailing wildly with iron-shod forefeet, the horse tore itself loose from Pinoff's grasp and rose into the air. Taken completely by surprise, the Oberstleutnant tumbled backward from the saddle, landing in the sandy soil so common to all Russian roadsides. 
A lancer dashed forward and seized the panic-stricken animal by the reins. Others moved to assist the officer to his feet. Brushing aside their offers of assistance, Katzman struggled to his feet and recovered his frightened horse. Glaring at me for several seconds, he turned and regained his mount before abruptly turning and riding past our now silent, horrified ranks, followed by his escort. The remaining portions of schnapps were collected by the gefreiters to be traded for candy and cigarettes. A sizable amount of forbidden firewater made its way to Favoli, Aina, Binau, and the various company commanders, where it was consumed in quantity. So generous were some of our company members in distributing the surplus that eventually the source of this breach of regulations was traced, and I received a verbal reprimand from the regimental commander. I did not hear another word concerning the roadside incident, although I waited with dreadful expectation to be summoned for disciplinary action. It is likely that Oberstleutnant Katzmann, though short-tempered and often tactless in his resolution of certain situations, was fully aware that to make an issue of the incident would have served no positive purpose under the given circumstances. The company commanders were called to battalion headquarters to be briefed on our current situation by Hauptmann Schmalfeld, the battalion commander. He solemnly advised us that farther to the south the enemy had broken through our front and we were assigned to protect the open flank of Army Group North from the massive Russian forces pouring past us toward the west. The battalion was hurriedly loaded into transports, and we were driven south over roads choking with dust. By late afternoon we had already relocated south of Duna. Following a short pause to organise the battalion, we advanced toward the south before dismounting from the vehicles. The Lanzers prepared for action, securing chin straps to their steel helmets, checking canteens of water, ensuring that magazines were fully loaded and that weapons were once again functioning faultlessly. Canvas sacks of hand grenades were distributed, and the infantrymen shared the burden of reserve machine gun ammunition. Suddenly a Kobel wagon sped by our position, and from the front passenger seat of the vehicle, Oberstleutnant Katzmann called above the clatter of the Volkswagen's air-cooled engine. Leutnant Beidemann, now show us what you can do! I brought my hand to the rim of my helmet in acknowledgement as he disappeared in a cloud of dust. We struck south without artillery support, penetrated the blocking fire of a Soviet howitzer battery, and shortly thereafter came under a concentrated mortar barrage. But miraculously we suffered no casualties. I led the company forward at a run, and as we cleared a small rise we suddenly found ourselves on a road occupied by Russian engineers, busily engaged in laying box mines in the evening twilight. The Russians scrambled for cover while opening fire with submachine guns in an attempt to protect themselves, but the detachment was raked by a machine gun burst Einya fired from the hip. The enemy attempted to scatter, and we took two pony carts and a truck under fire with our small arms and hand grenades. Within seconds the incident was over and the guns had fallen silent. We immediately began searching the corpses strewn in the road, and in the passenger seat of the bullet-riddled truck, I found a dying Russian colonel. I searched for and quickly located his blood-spattered map case in the last light of the sunset, and along with bars of sweet-smelling soap and paparossi cigarette packages, I uncovered the documents and maps. Stuffing the contents back into the leather case, I slung it over my shoulder and rallied the Lanzers, who were engaged in searching the pony carts for additional material. Of more importance to the hungry grenadiers for the moment, they had discovered several pasteboard boxes marked in English in black stenciled letters, and they enthusiastically stuffed their pockets and bread bags with the tinned meat found in the containers. The intelligence officer of the division later confirmed that the documents found on the fatally wounded colonel had revealed the detailed battle plans for the Third White Russian Front, and from the maps the main points of penetration against our defences could be determined. The documents also outlined a new system of attack to be implemented against us. The attacks would be opened by a heavy artillery barrage, followed closely by a low-angle blocking fire on the flanks of a corridor. Following closely within the two walls of bursting shells, in an area often no greater than 100 metres wide, tanks and infantry would advance. The enemy was again adopting our tactics. We deprived the enemy the use of the road for the remainder of the night, and the next morning we again moved toward the south, 
and arrived at the location of an abandoned Soviet howitzer battery position. Dozens of spent shells lay scattered among piles of empty and discarded tins, marked Oscar Mayer, Chicago. Our sister battalion was simultaneously fighting toward the south. Through the barrages from this Russian battery, they had sustained heavy losses, and the battalion commander, Major Schnepf, his adjutant, Leutnant von der Stein, and many others had fallen. With this attacking movement, we had thrust ourselves 30 kilometers within the open flank of the Russian army, whose units in this area were targeted directly toward part of our homeland, the Baltic Sea and East Prussia. Onward to Berlin, was the watchword of the Soviets. Father Stalin has commanded, and the patriotic front storms westward to destroy the hated German invaders. To the west must you attack, to avenge your fatherland, the land of the workers and farmers. The women of the enemy will be yours. There flows water from the walls, and you can wash yourselves and drink from porcelain containers. Instinctively, we sensed the disaster that lay ahead. But even the most sceptical among us could never imagine the fury that our opponents from the east would deliver upon our homeland. The regiment holding positions to the south had been bypassed and was threatened with encirclement. During the night of the 30th of June, the 1st of July, we received orders to march in a southerly direction toward Meoria. The battalion was divided into two groups, with two rifle companies, an alarm company, two self-propelled flak guns and a heavy anti-tank gun. I was assigned as a group leader under the command of Battle Group Ambrosius. Oberst Ambrosius had recently been the commander of the NCO school in Riga, and one recent afternoon he had simply been pulled from there with his staff and students and thrown into battle. This front, like so many others we had experienced, could be only thinly defended, and even then defence was limited to specific strategically important sectors. Our battle group was assigned to defend a sector approximately two kilometres in length. I positioned the anti-tank gun and the 20mm flak guns on our left flank to cover the road that led through our positions to the southeast. The remaining area had to be defended by the rifle companies. Four heavy machine guns and two 80mm mortars reinforced the right wing. With the rising sun, the Russians probed our positions in company strength. In the early afternoon, heavy artillery rounds began to fall in our sector, and we soon found ourselves under a torrent of shells that abated only when the enemy attempted to penetrate our positions again. We clung to our line through the 4th of July, when the Russians plunged through the positions south of our right flank. The first company, holding our southern sector, was compelled to counterattack in an attempt to close the penetration, and the company commander was among those killed in this action. At 14 o'clock, our radio fell silent. We were no longer able to establish contact with Oberst Ambrosius and his staff of academy instructors in Meoria. A reconnaissance platoon from my old company was dispatched in the direction of our right flank in an attempt to contact them, and they returned only to report that they had observed the town to be occupied by Russians. Our battle group continued to hold its positions, despite the repeated Russian attempts to break through the left sector with infantry reinforced with armour. In the evening twilight, as the Lancers lay behind their weapons, I crouched together with the radio operator who, bent over his communications equipment, vainly attempted to establish contact on the old frequency. Mina, Mina, please come in. Mina, please report. As darkness settled over us, I received instructions, relayed through the forward observers of a 150mm artillery unit, to pull back five kilometres north-northwest. We feverishly organised for the withdrawal, and under cover of night we abandoned our positions. Leading the way was one of our self-propelled flaks, the chassis piled high with members of the rifle company. The remainder of the rifle company followed with the anti-tank gun, the additional flak, and, bringing up the rear, the other two companies. I joined the rear guard with two groups from the second company. The concise orders had demanded that we withdraw at exactly twenty o'clock, without leaving a rear guard in the positions. Prior to our movement, more fire was exchanged, with infantry weapons and the two heavy machine guns firing tracers into the darkness. As we departed, the Russian mortar platoons fired sporadic salvos that impacted behind us. They received no reply. We followed a trail through a thickly wooded area that eventually turned north. 
Just prior to 22 o'clock, we arrived at the eastern outskirts of a burning village. The forward element came to a halt, and I hurried forward. After assessing the situation, we realised that we were now encircled and that we had no time to lose if we were to survive. From our location we could observe the village swarming with Russians, silhouetted against the fires that illuminated the area in a ghastly light. Near the edge of the forest, about 100 metres from the first burning house, I stood next to the gunner of the 20 millimetres. Ainer had rested his machine gun across the fender of the vehicle and was prepared to fire. The remainder of our group remained behind us, hidden in the shadows of the forest. After a moment's hesitation, we moved forward and passed the village to the east, the flames from burning huts sending ghostly shadows among the trees. Despite the grinding of the engine that powered the self-propelled flak, we remained unnoticed as we left the Russians behind us and eventually arrived at a forest-covered swamp. In the dim glow of a field lamp, I could see that my map outlined the northern edge of the swamp, beyond which was only a blank quadrant, void of the information we now required. Nevertheless, I realised that even this poorly executed map exhibited more information than many of our units would have had of the area. We proceeded through the forest until we entered a small clearing in the canopy of thick trees. From a small rise I looked toward the north and northwest, and at approximately ten kilometres distance it was possible to observe a number of flares hanging silently in the sky. Russian aircraft had released them in preparation for a bombing run. There were the front lines. That must be our target as well. I advised the men of our objective, and we moved on through the darkness.